they're, they can be terrestrial, a lot of them are, um, but they're still tied to water, both through their moist skin and also uh, because of reproduction. You've got, uh, they lay eggs in, in water, most of them, uh, there are a few by different things, but most of them lay their eggs in water and they hatch their as either tadpoles if they're endurance uh, or, or salamander larvae that they're larvae or if they're endurance. Uh, I probably should use Uridila, um, right? That's the one you used in the ad lecture. Caudate included some, some fossil ones, so Uridila would be a better uh, order to know. <coughs> in terms of uh, synapomorphies, uh, External fertilization. Most of them, uh, most of the manurians have external fertilization. A lot of the salamanders have those little spermatophores that allow internal fertilization. Most, most of those two lay their eggs in water in uh, little gelatinous capsules. So, this, so we'll see toads in the next few days when we go out in the field laying these big masses of, of eggs. Lots of, lots of babies, they're in this jelly, and uh, uh, the tadpoles, when they hatch, will, will eat the jelly, uh, or sometimes the jelly will even start to grow algae, and they'll, they'll eat that. There's a little of that bit of a head start. And as you know, that some, uh, the males basically get on top of the female in this urine, so when the eggs are expelled, <coughs> already, the leopard frogs are already mating, the, the spring peepers are mating, the uh, gray tree frogs are just starting. So we'll see, we'll see eggs when we go out in the field. We're going out, remember, on a field trip in two weeks. So in two weeks, uh, you'll need your rubber boots. For sure, we're going to get out in the water and go for frogs. Yeah, Dr. Cole, when the rail uh, responds to the field, is there like a certain time period? Last night or something like that, like a couple minutes? Or? Oh, 
it can last all night. Yeah, it can last a long time. Yeah. Yeah, now, sometimes it happens pretty quick, but uh, usually then uh, that the females can go off, eat a little bit for a week, uh, while, and come back and lay some more eggs. The males might stick around and call to try to attract another female. It just depends on the species. Yeah, uh, frilled hair, you, you've got a few of the tropical ones that do that. We don't see that much of So that's all really in terms of it. You've had a lot more in lecture. Um, what I want to do instead is go through the species so uh, I can tell you a little bit about how to recognize them so that most of what you'll be doing is just learning the names. Uh, all right. Uh, We've only got a few salamanders, uh, Sirenidae, the uh, siren, uh, intermedia. I guess I should keep this too. Are there any more? Any more? Got any more of that list? Let's make sure I cover it. <coughs> I think I've got them all. All right, so is that the first one on your list? You can bar no, you write on. But I, what you probably should do is write on the sides of each one if I give you any information. Okay. Yes, that is the first one. Okay, so they're aquatic, totally aquatic. Um, I've got the one in my, my uh, lab over there. I guess I can bring it in. So the gills show up. Um, they've, they've just got uh, front legs. They don't have any hind legs. So they're pretty easy to recognize from any other uh, uh, sound. Can eat things like uh, think, can eat things like uh, earthworms, uh, fish, fish, things like that. They're pretty abundant. We get them in in a lot of different environments. They can be in a cow pond or uh, in the in uh, smaller streams. Uh, we'll definitely get some when we go out and uh, set those mini things. Brought one of those to lecture. Yeah, yeah. I've still got that. Uh, another, okay, so Amphiuma, let me see, do it next, Amphiumidae. So that's the western less, lesser siren, siren intermediate. There is an eastern one too. Sirenidae. Amphiumidae. Three toed Amphiuma, Amphiuma tridactylum. So tridactylum refers to three toes. Uh, they've got hind feet, so you can see them uh, in this picture here. They're, but they're pretty small. All four limbs are pretty small. And the big thing is the, the gills are internal. So they, uh, they, that's how you can tell them from the sirens, even if I got you small. The amphiuma get, uh, get three, three or so feet in length. You can see how big this one is. They're also real slippery. It's hard to hold them. That's why she's got on plugs. Um, they're big and they can bite pretty good, but I, I've only found one or two to ever in East Texas. So you get up going to Louisiana and they're real abundant, but they're just not very common over here. Yeah, I did on purpose. Alright. Um, so that well I got these out of order. Uh, I'll just go with the order I got. The uh, Proteidae would be the Gulf Coast water dog. Uh, it's totally aquatic, so the gills uh, are external. Uh, it's got uh, a little bit bigger legs, um, big, bigger broad head. Um, so the way you tell this from the siren would be that it's got hind legs, uh, spots. Nectaris bayeri. If you if you've ever dissected uh, uh, mud puppies in biology one or anywhere maybe high school biology, they, they're a, they're a nectaris. They're very closely related, and um, they're used in high school biology labs a lot. These we get in uh, uh, only in our rivers around here. They're not found in ponds. Lakes. So we probably won't run into this one. 
Uh, the plethodonids, uh, plethodonidae are the lungless salamanders. Most of these are in the southeastern U.S. Uh, they are, are generally pretty small, no more than three or four inches. Uh, they're they're ter terrestrial as adults, and as a as the name implies, they don't have lungs. So what happens is they live in in really uh, cool, cold streams, mountain streams is where you tend to find them, and water oxygen uh, tends you get more oxygen in cold water than you do in warm water uh, and so there's enough oxygen and the cold water slows down their metabolism so that they can get all get enough uh, oxygen through their skin so they get all their oxygen through their skin being small it gives them a lot of surface area to for absorbing the, the oxygen um, there, there are a fair number of them just east of, of East Texas, but we only have one of, of this species uh, that I've ever found in Smith County. It's called the dwarf salamander, uh, Arisha quadridigitata. It, uh, it's pretty easy to recognize, besides the being real small, they have these these grooves between the nose and the upper lip. They're called uh, nasal labial grooves, and uh, that, that'll allow you to recognize it. You tend to have to use a microscope, so we'll, we'll grab a microscope today and kind of look at it from the front. You can see it pretty easily. They use that in terms of uh, signaling or sending chemicals. They can pick up chemicals from other members. You said nasolabial? Nasolabial grooves, yeah. <clears throat> the labia is the lip. So nasolabial means nose to lip. Next family, Salamandridae. So the uh, Salamandridae, uh, we only have one member, and that is the central newt, Nodophthalmus viridescens. Um, it does have kind of an interesting uh, life cycle, though, and they, they go through three stages instead of two. So they start off as uh, larvae that have gills on the outside, look like a typical salamander larva. And then they become terrestrial. And they're called the red Fs. E-F-T. Fs, not Fs. Fs. And uh, the red Fs, uh, the red with little spots on them. Uh, ours around here in East Texas tend to be a little browner. They're not real bright red. They live there uh, you know, maybe a year, up to seven years, depending on the location. But they'll live on land for a while, and then they mature and go back to the water and, uh, and become aquatic as adults. The adults, however, don't have the gills. So they, they, uh, they turn green and they have spots, uh, a flat tail, pretty easy to recognize. Uh, the ones we have in the lab. I don't think you'll have any trouble. The, uh, the red Fs are uh, using a posomatic coloration to warn predators that they're toxic. So they have a poison called tetrodotox. Uh, so if you see these and you play with them, uh, it's best not to lick your fingers or rub your eyes. A lot of salamanders and frogs are going to have some toxin in their skin, so it's always a good idea to wash your hands after the You know that says red elf? Just like I know. <laughs> it's misspelled. It's not elf. I think that was a spell checker automatically changed it. 
EFT. EFT. Uh, ambistoma, ambistoma D, uh, ambistoma D, excuse me, uh, are the, uh, well, they're the mole salamanders. They call them mole salamanders because they live underground. They tend to be fossorial. So, like a mole. As a group. And they tend to be black, uh, dark color. Um, we actually have several species in East Texas, but I'm only going to have you learn three of them. Um, these are the three that you're most likely to see. Uh, the uh, smallmouth salamander, Ambistoma texanum, is pretty abundant in floodplains, bottomlands around here. It's a uh, it's kind of a dark salamander with some light bluish uh, modeling on it. It's kind of hard to see in the picture. It's hard to see in the preserve too, but you'll see some lighter spots on it. The uh, marbled salamander is pretty easy to tell. Uh, Ambistoma texanum. It's got that. Uh, these, these bars on it, white bars, pretty easy. Um, they're kind of interesting. The, the salamanders normally go back to water and lay their eggs. The marble salamander actually waits for the water to come to it. So they'll hide under rocks and stuff near the water's edge. And then when a flood comes and the water comes up, then they'll lay their eggs. And they, and they hang around them and protect them. Um, it's kind of different. Yeah, Robert? Yeah, I don't know if you're going to play that. I have it on here. Is, you you have have it it on here. Let's try oh, okay. I've got it wrong up here. I'm sorry. Yeah, I must have copied. Sorry about that. Opaque them. So use your book. I mean your your sheet. Thank you, Robert. Didn't notice that. Uh, the uh, uh, last ambistoma is the tiger salamander. It's quite a bit bigger. Uh, Tigrinum. They, the ones we have in East Texas might get seven, eight inches in length. Pretty easy to recognize. Uh, the uh, it's, it's dark with with these uh, yellowish bands that are pretty distinctive. So don't think you'll have any trouble with these three. So I think the salamanders you can learn pretty quickly now. The the anurans, um, got a fair number of families, so you might want to uh, look at your book, your, your lecture book, uh, this table in chapter 10 might be useful to you a little bit, but uh, the, uh, the field guide that you have will have them too. Uh, the endurance, uh, the big thing is that they've adapted, or their body has has changed such that uh, locomotion is now accomplished by jumping. And so they've lost the, the tail and they've developed a, a hips that kind of help them spring with their hind legs. So they use the hind legs primarily for the jumping and the, the hip bones uh, have uh, lots of muscle attachment so they can spring off and jump quite a ways uh, in some species. The front limbs tend to be uh, involved in absorbing the landing. Uh, the uh, ribs are gone, uh, so the belly kind of hangs. Uh, you really don't want ribs when you crash down anyway because you might break them when you land. And then the vertebra are reduced in numbers too. The other, the other big thing for uh, frogs and toads is that they use calls instead of odors for uh, communication. So the salamanders tend to use pheromones for communication. Endurance use their calls. Uh, and they're called advertisement calls when the male is trying to advertise both where he is, what his species is, 
may be how uh, how good a genes he has. He, uh, you know, he's, he's got a really good voice, uh, that kind of thing. And then the females can hear that uh, basically uh, with the, the uh, columella. So each species has the ability to hear their own species. Part of the reason that they can do that is some, some of the adaptations they have for breathing. Uh, amphibians have, have ones that have lungs and force air in, into the lungs using the buccal pump. And the buccal pump works by bringing the throat down, bringing air into the throat, and then pushing on the throat. That's the buccal region. And it pumps air into the lungs. Now, in doing so, they're kind of pre-adapted then for, for uh, putting, pushing air out. Because when the air goes out of the out of the uh, buccal region, they can make a noise. And uh, the uh, particular noise they make will signal things to uh, other members of their species, both maybe a territorial response to the males or an attraction for the females. We actually can look at these pretty easily with some, some uh, equipment uh, that will translate those sounds into frequencies, and they're called sonograms, and uh, I'll play some later today. We'll get them, you can get them online and look at them. We've got some in our computers, too. And it's kind of useful when you have related species. You can tell exactly what you've got uh, by looking at these uh, songs. Because sometimes the species will look identical, like our gray tree frogs do, but they have different calls. And so you can tell that's really the only way to tell them apart. All right, let me run through the frogs and toads pretty quickly. Um, Fowler's toad. Uh, is in the family uh, Buffonidae, Anaraxis, Phalari. Uh, pretty easy to tell. Uh, there's <coughs> careful. There's a lot of color variation in them in East Texas. You'll get red ones, you'll get brown ones, you'll get gray ones. So don't let somebody bring you one and say, hey, I think this is something different. Uh, you really have to look at the, uh, the paratoid gland. Uh, the paratoid gland is this large gland behind the eye. Uh, and it, it's, it's kind of bean shaped. And other toads, it'll be shaped uh, differently. They also have some other little words looking like things. Uh, kind of, I'm not sure where the, the idea that toads can cause your words came from, but somewhere from that. But the fact that when you pick them up, their bladder will be full of water, and if you disturb them in one of the ways they, I guess, maybe to scare you, they squirt all the water out. It's, it's just, you know, urine, so it's not a dangerous or anything. Um, they tend to be pretty small. They're pretty easy to recognize because of the warts. Um, and they'll have, uh, as I said, they'll have uh, multiple warts, multiple bumps inside of these dark blotches. Tend to be uh, pretty dry adapted. Uh, they will dry out if, if they don't have some moisture, they can they burrow down in, in, the, in the dirt and they can survive in our um, uh, weather, uh, in our drier conditions. Is that the tympanic membrane you were referring to back up there on the, uh, the green one? Yeah, the tympanic membrane is right here okay. and right here. Yeah. So that area is thin and it will vibrate with sound. So that's what transmits it. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice is when they're swallowing, the eyes will sink in. So maybe we'll get a live one that will feed them. And you can see, you'll see that uh, they push in with their eyes to swallow. Is that for all frogs or all animals? It's, it, it's one of those uh, uh, synapomorphies that we see in the dirt. Okay. That's for culinary as well, that. Yeah, that, that muscle, that vulva only. Sorry, what, what's the paratoid gland? Oh, I'm sorry, paratoid gland. It, it's a poison gland that's even, I mean, like I, I said, that the skin has 
poison uh, lands in them. This one has a concentration of them, and it releases a, a poison called bufotoxin. Yeah. And, and uh, it's, if you've ever bothered a toad a lot, occasionally you'll see this white mucus start to come out of that area. And it's, uh, it's toxic, it would, it would taste bad. Yeah. I'm sorry? It's a hallucinogen. Yeah, yeah. Toad licking is not <laughs> advised in here. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's it'll make a dog throw up. So you know, probably not a great thing. To do. Another uh, toad. Is, uh, the word toad is kind of problematic. It's, uh, it doesn't really imply anything. But we do talk about these as. as Spadefoot toads, and I misspelled it, so why well, I should say this. I should have checked this a little more carefully. Um, herders, Spadefoot, uh, Escapiophis herderi, named after a guy named Herder who discovered them. Um, they look a little bit like the uh, Bufo, uh, but they had this little spade on their foot, a little hard spade. They use it for digging, and, and these guys stay underground uh, a lot of the year. And then when you get a hard rain in the summer, they'll come out, they breed very fast, lay lots of eggs, and the eggs hatch out and grow up real quick, a couple weeks. And so by the time the little uh, pool has dried up, hopefully little baby uh, toads will be hopping out. So they're called explosive breeders because they do that. Um, I haven't seen any in a long time uh, in East Texas. We used to have a, a lot of them. Um, I haven't seen one in 10 years, so I'm not sure what's happened, but they seem to be gone. Fire ants, probably. Could be fire ants. Uh, not sure why, but yeah. Um, this is one of the species that can handle uh, even desert conditions because they stay underground until the, the rains are Scapiopi, so that spades the key. Uh, Hylidae, these, these are pretty easy to tell. Uh, they have little suckers on their hands, on their feet, and they'll walk more than they jump. They can jump, and they can jump a long ways, but they tend to walk on surfaces. We have two, two species, the uh, green tree frog, Hylus in area, uh, and it's easy to recognize. Now, the green color in alcohol, we keep them in alcohol, will, will disappear and turn blue, bluish gray. So don't rely on, on a green tree frog being green. They'll kind of be blue. But what you will be able to see is this, this white line. You see the white line there? It goes down the side of the body. It's pretty distinct. Now the gray tree frog um, is kind of a weird one because it could be one of two species in East Texas. Um, it could either be Versicolor or Chrysophilus. And I think I put just, um, which one did I put on here? Well, um, I guess I've got them both on there. You can't tell them apart uh, unless you hear them. What happened is one of them is a triploid of the other. And it has uh, three sets of chromosomes instead of two. And it will not breed with the other one. But its call is a lot faster than the other, than the other one. So um, I, I think I've heard both of them in East Texas, um, but, I, but Versicolor seems to be more common. They they're they've got a couple distinguishing characteristics. When you catch a live one, they have yellow legs back part of their legs are bright yellow. And it's probably an aposematic coloration because if you put one of these gray tree frogs in a bag with other frogs, the other frogs will all die. So, um, and, and definitely don't rub your eyes after handling these. Because it will sting pretty good. They're, that will fade out in alcohol, and, but they have these kind of H-looking marks on the back. That, that, 
The uh, other highlight E that we have, uh, again, you can kind of tell by markings on the back, the spring peeper, which is, is almost done reading, it has a big X on its back. The cricket frogs, which are the little ones you see around the ponds, uh, very fast, and they can jump a long ways. They have a, a little triangle between their eyes, a little dark triangle between their eyes. These are polymorphic. Some of them will have red stripes on them. Some have green like this one. Um, in the same place, you'll see both of them. So I'm not sure what the what the deal is there. But look for that little black or little dark triangle between the eyes. Um, they also have uh, striped pants. I'll show you that. Um, the upland chorus frog, Sedacris uh, frenarium. Uh, has little uh, streaks, dark streaks down here. Uh, this one's disappeared too. Uh, I haven't seen any. We have actually had two other species of horse frogs and they're all gone. The microhylidae are uh, the narrow mouth toads. We have both species and I still see both of them. Uh, the eastern is much more common than the western. Um, it's a little toad, little fat thing, very small mouth. Um, they eat ants. They have a little fold of skin between the eyes, and when they grab an ant and it tries to bite them, the fold will come down and cover the eyes to protect them. So they eat ants. Gastrophrini carolinensis. Um, they they have a really uh, Deep call, they sound like a, a, a sheep. Uh, in the summertime, you'll hear them, they go, bah, bah. Um, just and they're 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 incredibly loud. loud. Incredible, they're louder than that, yeah. And they're teeny tiny. Um, Olivacea has a slightly different frequency in its call, um, and that's how they can uh, prevent interbreeding through the different frequencies of so I'm uh, just listening from a distance can you tell them apart? Uh, I don't know that I've ever heard the Western, but I'm sure I'm sure if you use the sonogram you can tell them apart. And I imagine it's different now. Uh, they obviously can. Yes? What's the physical uh distance? How do you just discern the two uh uh how do I what? How do you discern the two narrow Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, throat and a, I mean a, a dark throat and a light belly and the other one has a, a dark belly and a light throat but I'm trying to remember which is which. Do you remember which one's which? I think the I think the, uh, I think this one has the light belly. And so you basically look at the bellies to tell the two apart. But I didn't I just give you one of them only? No, we didn't. Did I give you both of them? Okay. Eat ants as well, or not? What now? The eastern near mouth toad feeds on ants. They both do. They both do. Yeah, so both they both have ants. that covering yep. the body. It's called an epicanthic fold. Um, the ranity. Uh, this, this group we have the most species in, and it's really the most widespread group in the world. Uh, they get farther north than any other frog. Um, pretty easy to, to tell the four apart, though. There's a couple things you want to look for. Uh, look at, at this ridge that goes down behind the eye. It's called the dorsal lateral ridge. And then the other thing to look for are the, the way in which the spots are oriented. So the bullfrog, American bullfrog, um, is Lithobates capsbianus. Um, and its dorsal lateral ridge goes around the tympanum and down. It just circles right around the tympanum. It doesn't go down the body at all. 
so they're they're also green and they have these wormy looking dark patches on the belly. But, but that's the key. Look at that dorsolateral ridge. Bronze frog looks a lot like the the, the bullfrog. It doesn't get as big. But look at this dorsolateral ridge. It comes all the way down to the hips. The, the leopard frog has dark blotches. And notice there's a there's a light spot in the tip of it. Can you see that up there? On the leopard frog, southern leopard frog, Cenocephalus. It, it has a, a light spot in the tip of Pickerel frog is another one that's that's toxic and you don't want to rub your eyes. And it also has yellow legs like the uh, gray tree frog did. But it has blotches that come in two rows down the back. So there'll be these, these rows of blotches down the back. And that's uh, Lithobates blusters. I still see a few of those, but they're really have declined a lot. Definitely not a lot. What light spot did you say was on the leopard? On the tip of behind the eye, can you see the little white spot in it? I don't have my pointer in problem. Can you see that little spot right there? Oh, okay. That's the tip of them. It's got a light spot. Yeah. Okay, so this right here is the dorsolateral ridge. And instead of going down the body, it circles the tip of it. This one, it, these go down uh, about three quarters of the way. This one goes all the way down to the tailbone. So that'll help you some. So the brown frog is also called the green frog? Yes. Okay. Yeah, is that what's in your book? It, green it says green frog here. Okay. Sorry, I thought I, I didn't realize I wasn't getting one of the things that happens with common names is uh, we may have a subspecies here that has its own common name, and those change get changed a lot. And, so, and that, so the common names sometimes change. I, I wouldn't count off bronze frog or green frog either one. Because obviously I get messed up. Okay? And I think that's it. So the other thing is, you'll probably get through those before the day's over, and if you want to go ahead and start on the turtles, we, we did bring them out. Okay, so you can start on your turtles too. Because the snakes and lizards are, there are a lot of them. So they'll be, they'll take up next week a lot, uh, pretty much. Okay? And I will go make a better list too. So, uh, As you learn them, you might help each other. You know, they're definitely, you're not competing with each other, so you can come up with a, a, a way to identify things. And you all that's your book, right? You're definitely going to need your book. Again. All right, I'll go print those off. Um, according to the document, like they say that the You've got a field guide, and it shows pictures of the field guide. Use your field guide. Thank you for doing this. I got an idea. I was working on the laptop that makes it on my phone. Actually, I can actually work. All right, get you guys.
not recommend carrying anything by the lid. So always have one hand under the jars because some of these lids are old and may crack on them. You need to clean it up. Yeah, right. Hey, Isabel, I think you're still in the, that. my notes from when I took the video over the cardiology. Right. Feel free to edit it and send it out to you. Better. Better all for me. I right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should be helpful. This is a hard test. Yeah, I think I did. Hey, I didn't write that test.